five words that define us, integrative, convergence, economic development, at scale, and societal impact. And so it is with great pleasure that I have uh, the opportunity to introduce to you somebody today who represents all of these in many ways. Josh Hutcherson, is, is, you know, when you have a kid and he goes away and then does very well, in a way I feel like that because I was at Florida International University and we had the pleasure of, of bringing in Dr. Hutcherson as a young assistant professor. And I mean, he has a, had a meteoric rise. He was, his office was down down the corner from me. And so many times we, I would get, I'd be able to talk to him, hear about his ideas and see him doing things, not just in his lab and not just in his ideas, but bringing these sectors together and communicating things out. So um, he got his bachelor's and master's from Georgia Tech and a PhD from Vanderbilt. But when I found him was because one of his mentors was visiting us in York at FIU and he was at Harvard, at, at Harvard. And we were talking and, and I was saying, you know, if we could only make a partnership. And he said, I the perfect person who could help make that partnership. And he's a postdoc, I think you were a postdoc with, him that, uh, with her at that time. And he said, we are going to make a way to bring him here. And we did. <laughs> and uh, we were very happy that George joined us. So uh, he has many remarkable achievements for his scientific part, and he's going to give a talk today in biomedicine engineering. So thank you, biomedicine engineering, for bringing Josh here. But this morning, uh, we are going to hear from him a little bit differently, and to see how, while you're doing research, and this is a learning experience for all, that you don't have to just be a researcher in your narrow technical field. There are many other things you can bring together. And that, as we talk, we want deployment of solutions and in order to do deployment of solutions, these are the things that you have to do if you are going to get your research out and having a societal impact. So Josh, welcome. If you haven't noticed the bow tag, that's the signature. <laughs> even integrate into my, my lab logo, my architecture design. Um, so thank you for having me. I'm really, really honored to be here. It's really great to hear about all the things that are going on here at IQDAR, and then also uh, over in the Department of Biomedical Engineering, looking forward to visiting over there later. So this is a different talk than what I um, would normally give, and in the afternoon I'll give a more traditional research talk. So uh, this was what I was charged with. This was the email from, from Dr. Jung that came in a, a few weeks ago, and at the time I thought it sounded great, when I realized I had to put together slides, <laughs> this is my science. Uh, I, yeah, I'm glad it came together, though. I think, it, I think hopefully it'll be fun, uh, and I want it to be interactive. But um, Dr. Jung asked, reached out and asked for me to talk about um, some of the entrepreneurship stuff that we're doing, Heart Month, our Thirst for Science series. I'll get into all these things later. Um, and I started thinking, how am I going to fit all this into, into one talk? Because we do enjoy doing a lot outside of the traditional um, traditional research. And she said, well, I'm still being top-notch researchers. I'm not sure if I, I fit that bill, but that's how, <laughs> hopefully I, I do both well. So, so I started thinking about why do I do a lot of the things that I do? Uh, and, and I wanted... You know, sometimes I, I lucked into these things, or I, I assume they started initiatives, almost honestly, just because I was interested in it. And that's going to be the, the theme. And, and um, so I'm going to start out by just telling you kind of who I am and kind of what drives some of these things that I do. And so, um, so I'm originally from Atlanta, grew up in Lithia Springs, Georgia, just about uh, 20 miles outside of Atlanta, did my undergrad at Georgia Tech. I actually started my graduate degree at University of Alabama, Birmingham, as the first PhD student in a very junior faculty's lab. After my first year, we got recruited to Vanderbilt. Uh, so I finished up there, um, spent four years in Boston as a, as a postdoctoral researcher. This is actually the view outside my office window up there. So it was on the 17th floor of this also very center for interdisciplinary cardiovascular sciences, so much the same theme, sponsored by industry. Um, and, and so I really enjoyed being in these hybrid clinical research industry environments. Uh, and then I uh, was recruited to, to FIU. So, I've given some of these types of talks before, at least thinking about my career path. And one thing I always like to mention, especially if there's anyone who is a student or, or a trainee in the um, in the room, is that it's really easy to stand up and give a talk and make it like you had everything planned from the beginning and everything converged the way you just exactly like you planned it to. When in fact nothing ever works out, right? So so if it looks like that, that's not the case, right? Uh, but you can start to tie threads together because you, if you do follow your passion or, or pursue things that you're interested in, there you find out there was a common theme there all along. So we're going to go way back. Right? So I've got, you know, 40 minutes or so to fill. So <laughs> we'll start from the beginning. Uh, this is me and my mom and dad. Um, 
I spent a lot of time actually in Florida when I was a kid. Uh, we always had family vacations up in the up in the Panhandle. You might notice my parents were very young. Um, my, my mom was only 20 years old when she when she had me. So I was the first in my family to uh, to go to college, um, and, and for for at least several generations, uh, including I was the oldest cousin. So I was kind of had no idea kind of what I wanted to do. I just knew that I was pretty good in school. My parents were made sure that I worked hard, um, but didn't really you know have any guided direction from them of where I would go. The only direction I had to be my little my little baby sister, who's not such a baby anymore, um, but was that I knew I liked Georgia Tech. Um, <laughs> and part of this was born out of, so we were near Atlanta. My dad grew up very poor um, and uh, our relatives, we had uh, brother, uh, four brothers and sisters. And one thing that he remembered as a child was going to Georgia Tech junior varsity football games with his dad, because uh, it was free to go at the time. He used to have JV football games. So I grew up a Georgia Tech fan as well. You know, a little Georgia Tech jacket here. So I was good at math and science. So why not just go to Georgia Tech, right? Again, not necessarily knowing what I wanted to pursue, right? But New England is something that is a place I like to be, um, and, and, and you know, engineering seemed like something that might be might be interesting to to pursue. But it was really here that I met my met my first kind of true academic mentor, and I started as an undergrad. And I promise I'm going to bring all this back around later. So it's not just a biography or autobiography. Um, I didn't know as an undergrad that research was a mission of a lot of big universities, right? I just assumed it was an extension of high school. Uh, and I was just looking around for a job, and luckily Mark Frausnitz, um, who does drug delivery work, had an under, a paid undergrad position open, which was fairly rare. And for some reason, which I still don't understand, uh, he took me on. I thought he was like really senior and old at the time. I've re come to realize now he's about he was about the time six or seven years younger than I am right now. <laughs> uh, but he's done really well. He's a national academy member and does, has been a pioneer in, in the world of drug delivery. But he brought me in, and I remember the first time I got to do an experiment in this lab and realized that I was doing something, just something fairly minor, but it was something that probably no one else had done, or at least very few people had done that exactly. And that blew my mind, right? It was unlike a chemistry lab where you were working toward a known answer, right? That idea that you're working toward an unknown, you're trying to fill a knowledge gap, was really cool. And, and, and you know, so I, I spent, I, I started the summer after my freshman year in this lab. Um, and stayed all the way through, and you still didn't know. I, I always assumed I would go to college and then go get a job, right, and, and, and make money and stay in Atlanta. Um, and he convinced me that, you know, if you truly love research, by this time I've been doing research for him for a few years, you know, don't look at training as delaying your career. Look at it as starting your career. This is something you want to do, right? And that was a message that really stuck with me as I decided to take my next step, which then was pursue graduate school. So, um, so I, I, I left Georgia Tech and I was starting to look at um, PhD positions, ended up at UAB because the chair at the time, Tim Wick, was a former Georgia Tech professor. Uh, he had come back and recruited some of us and said, sounds great, it's near Atlanta still. I met my girlfriend who is now a wife, she was still living in Atlanta, so that was pretty good to only be about an hour and a half away. Um, and I met this man, Dave Merriman, who became my PhD mentor. Um, and it was the first time, it sounds a little bit silly, maybe being a, you know, a white guy from the suburbs to talk about representation, but it was the first time I saw someone who, he was also a first-generation college student who grew up in the South. Uh, it was the first time I'd seen somebody who looked something like me, who had this position and, and convinced me that this is the greatest job in the world. You get to sit around and uh, come up with new ideas and it's, it's super fun. He didn't tell me all the emails that I have to answer and things like that, <laughs> but, but, but he really convinced me that this was something that, that I could pursue. Um, and so I did, and, and stayed with him and got my, my PhD, uh, and I just kind of kept walking through doors. So just so happened, as I was finishing my PhD, Elena Itawa, who was up in Boston at Harvard Medical School, she's a renowned vascular pathologist, had reached out to Dave and said, hey, I have a postdoc position. And uh, Dave said, you should go and visit Elena and pursue this. And this is the first email that she, uh, she ever wrote me, and she was starting this big center. Uh, phoned about co pharmaceutical. She said, it's going to be great. You can get to understand translation. You get to work in the clinical environment. And, and then you saw the view outside my window. She brought me up for a talk. And I was like, I'm sold. So <laughs> again, it wasn't like I had planned, oh, someday I'm going to work with Elena. But, but this is kind of how it worked out. And, and, and she was really great about helping me think outside the box of, of being a little crazy, trying new things and, and, and taking risks. She's very, very, very good. And then just so happened, uh, she was invited, I believe probably Sharon Ramaswamy uh, from our department invited her down to give a talk in, uh, in our department. So this was two days after my birthday in 2015. 
Uh, she came down and, and gave a talk on this work. I mentioned she's a pathologist by training. I think she was presenting some of our engineering work in the department, which is the stuff I was doing in her lab. Um, and it wasn't very long when Dr. Jones called um, and uh, somehow convinced me that Miami is a great place to live. She's an excellent salesperson. Um, <laughs> FIU was growing, but she was absolutely right. She didn't tell any, 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 any falsehoods. Um, and convinced me to come down and join the department. I met other mentors, Dr. Lydia Koss, uh, who now is UC Riverside. Um, but, I, but I've met some wonderful mentors along the way who really helped, helped shape my career. So the, the part of the portion of this talk is find good mentors, right, if you're a junior. And, and uh, several mentors, don't rely on just one, but also pursue passions. And if doors open in front of you, walk through them. Don't be afraid to do that. But in thinking through where we've gone from there, I kind of wanted to break it down into what we're doing in three different categories. And so for those of you, again, who maybe are trainees, you know, oftentimes as academics, we get evaluated these three areas, these three pillars, research, teaching, and, and, and service. Um, and, and I think, you know, I want to show you that my main message is rather than separate pillars, we should start envisioning things as a holistic academic program. Don't think of service is something you do in from teaching, something you do in from research, that you can integrate them all together, which I think is a, is a mission here, right? Um, and I think if you do that, you'll become much happier in all three, right? So I'll start out with kind of where we are on the research front, but you're going to see some common threads um, all the way through. So first, I wanted to mention that I am an, an advocate for basic research, right? Um, so we, we do a lot in our lab that's, you know, what people would consider truly basic research that I have a very tough time explaining to my family of why I care about how melanocytes are making elastic fibers in the aortic valve. Something that seems very far away from perhaps any kind of clinical realization. You know, we, we think it'll have an impact someday. The more you know, the more you know, right? Um, but it's a bit farther away. But I also like a lot of our research to be grounded in very translational work. As well. and so we tend to run the full uh, spectrum all the way from basic research to uh, the translational stuff. And it's really these things that I'm talking to folks outside the lab that, that I, I kind of start with and focus on, try to get them hooked with, because the people can really gravitate toward this and, and, and grab on, especially the one on the, the bottom right here that I'm going to um, discuss a little bit more, but trying to do risk assessment for cardiovascular disease and come up with low cost ways to find people in need of interventions, things that can be easily deployed in, in, um, in community uh, settings, under research. Yeah, under resource settings. And, and this just kind of gives you a motivation. I'm going to have this in some of my slides uh, later in the research, but, um, but you know, thinking through what are the big problems that we're trying to solve in cardiovascular disease? That's really my, my, right? And it's that we know that a lot of cardiovascular disease is preventable, right? Or at least we could do something about it to really save a person's, uh, save a lot of money, save a lot of time, save a lot of morbidity if we find people early and intervene them. But the problem is people don't go to the doctor until they have severe chest pain, right? Um, otherwise healthy people, and this is, this is even exacerbated in say underserved communities where taking time off because just because you're a little bit short of breath, taking time off work, the expenses to getting to a clinic, all of those things make you more reluctant to go seek treatment for something that seems relatively minor, right? And so we try to come up with ways to tackle that. What could we do to tackle some of these, these disparities find people who are in need of intervention earlier, and, and then assess uh, intervention, right? Um, and so I want to give out a shout out to my wife here. This is not a wife. This is Valentina Dorg and Valentina. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make that clear. Um, uh, so actually, that, this idea um, came from my wife. So my wife is a classically trained opera singer. When I was in graduate school, she was uh, studying at the Year Dozen Throat Institute at Vanderbilt as part of her degree at Belmont University in Nashville. And we were looking at how the vocal folds, they look a lot like your aortic valve. Uh, and we were talking about vocal fold pathologies and how if you get a nodule in your vocal folds, how it changes the way those little vocal folds shake and that changes how your voice sounds, right? So the idea was, well, aortic valve disease is something we study. And if that little structure changes just a little bit, it's got to change the sound your heart is making. And that's kind of what the doctor is looking for when he or she puts a step to find, right? But they tend to look at, listen, they tend to listen for big sounds, big changes, right? But with the advent of machine learning, right, we should be able to pick up very, very minute things that might be inaudible right? And can we do that to then diagnose aortic valve disease? So folks who don't get diagnosed risk way too when they already have a lot of other problems. And so Valentina has led this project. So that's an easy story to tell, right? That, that's this kind of translational story is, is one that I think people can gravitate toward. And that's, and that's what, uh, what I meant by that translational side of, of the lab. But she's really led this effort to then analyze 
sound waves recorded in a digital deficit. And this was the idea. Can structural change in the aortic valve due to this, this remodeling we care about change these sound characteristics? And she's gone through, I promise, this is the last data slide I think I want to show the whole talk. But she's gone through and, and we use a lot of mouse models and, and we're now uh, working on moving in the clinic. We collaborated with uh, Dr. Zach Danziger from our department uh, to do some machine learning approaches, but to show that indeed, punchline, uh, we can do a really nice job. So it turns out clinicians are only good at this about 30% of the time. Uh, and we're about, you know, around 90%, we can nicely classify our mouse in this case in terms of what type of heart disease they have or whether they're normal. Um, and so this is really powerful, right? And this is even earlier than we can see normal clinically related changes, so changes in blood flow. Uh, and so we're, we've been really excited about this. And, and Valentina is, is amazing. Uh, so she's taken this and said, well, this is something that we could now deploy now. Right? We could take out of the lab now. And she's given pitches and won, uh, won prizes for, for, for her pitches. So one of the moral of the story here, too, is finding good people to work for you because <laughs> she's, she's awesome and has led a lot of this work. Um, so we had this crazy idea. Okay, now we're going to get this out of the lab. right? And so we said, we're going to go through the path. We're going to go to the NSF I core. Right? So we're going to, so NSF I core kind of, you know, is a, a mechanism if you want to bring things out of the lab and maybe establish a business. The first thing you do, though, is they say, forget about your solution. Right? Or, or come up with some business thesis. But when you're going out into the field, ask people what their pain points are. Okay? Um, and so this is what we thought. This is going to be an AI-based tool that all clinicians are going to adopt. They're going to have in the clinic. It's going to change the way they, they do clinical practice. And this is what our original business thesis. So we went out. We interviewed whatever this was, 108 people. This was not just clinicians. This was also insurance companies. These were patients. Uh, uh, nurse practitioners, uh, so all across the board, to try to understand what their pain points were and kind of what our customer base might be if we wanted to get this out of the lab. Well, it turns out we weren't quite right. We were maybe close, and we're still trying to figure this out. We received a lot of feedback, and you better be ready if you're going to do this to hear a lot of things that you don't want to hear, right? We had some people tell us, I'm never going to do this, right? I can't build that, right? Th things are really discouraging. Right, that I can't build that. So it's not going to be something I'm going to adopt into my clinical practice, right? And it did change the way we think about it. And so we're now thinking of this maybe as an at-home tool, like a blood pressure cuff, something that you can, they can enable telemedicine. So now we're, we're kind of re, re, we're thinking about how this might be deployed. And it kind of came, came out of this. Uh, so this is kind of where we are now. So we went from, from that to the detect and monitor progression of heart valve disease uh, and helping determine the best treatment course. So what the, what the idea now is that People might be able, they might know they have heart valve disease, but right now the clinicians, this is one of the feedback we get. So what? Right? Because we don't have any treatment. So we find these people, what are we going to do for them? And say, so then that led us to, well, what if we could tell you, what if we could help you monitor them from home? Right? And then they can then send this back to you and you can help monitor the progression and then help determine exactly when you should intervene with a replacement procedure, which is all they could do. Right? So it, it kind of evolved our, our way of thinking. So this idea of stakeholder engagement early in research, I think, is something that we all need to be thinking about, even on the basic level. And I'll show you another example of that. So we're also involved in PATSUP, which is an engineering research center funded by the NSF. It's, it's um, the lead institution at Texas A&M. So it includes Texas A&M, Rice, FIU, and UCLA, focused on developing technologies for underserved populations, specifically in diabetes and cardiovascular. Um, but one thing that I, I've always really enjoyed and thought of um, was special about this ERC was, okay, we've got these different thrusts that are focused on biochips and clinical biosensors and, you know, um, mobile computational imaging systems and wearable technologies. But it's really this thirst for, this thirst, this thrust for, I think sip of water, that was a subliminal that I want, I want the water. <laughs> this thrust for that talks about biohavioral, uh, biohavioral in inference and patient response, where the people in this thrust are going out into the field. As, as things are developed in the other thrusts, as prototypes are developed, they go out and they say, look at this, what, how, what do you feel about this app? Right? Would you use this? You know, we've learned things about you know, how intuitive colors are in the game, or, or if you're you know, trying to um, help somebody monitor blood pressure, right? they prefer to see a dial that goes from green to red, your blood pressure fat, rather than a number that they may not, if it's something they think about every day, they don't know what 130 over 90 is, right? Things like that just by going out in the field. 
Um, we thought there were going to be some some major issues with implantable virus sensors. Turns out that's not a big issue to a lot of people that we that are like diabetics, for example. They would love to, have, right? At least you know, not consensus, but that's that's kind of some of the feedback. So involving that as an early part of the process, involving those having those conversations with people who will actually be using the technologies is critical. Otherwise, you end up with years worth of work that can't make an impact because you're not going to, no one's going to adopt it. I'm seeing this more and more. So I was just last week at the Heart Valve Society meeting in, in Boston, and this meeting is starting to have in this conference have sessions and talks given by patient advocacy groups, um, where people are coming in and saying. You know, this is this is the this is what I dealt with. This is I didn't know I was I didn't know I had bowel disease for this amount of time because I didn't recognize the symptoms. If someone had told me this, it might have changed my life earlier. Or this is what helped me. This is what you know. This is what I didn't like about the process. And those of us who are researchers, who are clinicians, can then take that feedback and start maybe acting on it earlier. So, so I think my my, my message from the research part of things as I move into the the other other two, which would be a little little different, is that. We need to be engaging people early. And I think even um, so the, the president of the society who does a lot of basic research in her lab, even she actually now has um, she recruits people from the population, she does this advertising so people from the population, she pays them some stipend to come into her lab meetings and sit in her lab meetings and learn about what they're doing, provide feedback. Just a you know, a lay person who may not have any formal scientific, right? Just to help ground her and say, you know, is what I'm doing having an impact? And can we explain what we're doing to someone who doesn't have that formal training? I think, which is also extremely important to every the convention. But, you know, a real deep involvement, I do think, requires an educated patient population and educated general population about what we do in science. And that's where the, the next two things. So feel free to interrupt me at any time. So, so I'll go into the, the teaching side of things. Uh, and so I also try to incorporate some of these lessons about grounding teaching, you know, kind of grounded research in some kind of, you know, tangible solution to some societal problem. I try to do the same thing when I'm teaching, right? So the classes I teach uh, the most uh, are biomedical engineering transport, uh, and I teach a cardiovascular biomechanics class in, this, in the spring. Um, and this person comes up a lot in this class. I don't know if anybody knows who this is. It's not Napoleon, so I didn't, I didn't make it that easy. So this is Joe DePoyer, okay? Uh, so you've probably heard of Poirier. You may have heard of Poirier, the Poirier Transform, Right, so thinking through frequency domain analyses, um, or in transport, it also the heat equations. Right, so in terms of thinking about conduction and heat, um, and, and so we teach oftentimes, and I try to do this whenever I can. These concepts, and we throw out these names, but no one knows who the person is behind all of this. Right, uh, and and it turns out, you know, I always tell tell my students that some of this might be. Kind of apocryphal, like the, 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 some of these stories may not be completely true, but they're tied to some kind of truth, right? Um, but it helps them remember it and understand at least part of the motivation of what Poirier, why Poirier was doing what he was doing. But it turned out he was in Napoleon's army uh, and was in Egypt with Napoleon. And at least it seems that part of the thing he was commissioned for was to understand how often they could fire their cannons without the cannon having issues, right? Think So then you're thinking through heating in the cannon every time you're firing. Right? You're thinking through studying conduction, heat conduction through the cannon. And then you're thinking through a time varying signal in terms of how that heat is changing based upon the rate of cannon fire. Right? So then you can start thinking about frequency domain analysis. Basically, right? So you start to understand, okay, that's why this was developed. Right? Um, and it also turns out that, oh, before I go there, um, you can tell funny stories too because you start learning these are people. Right? We worked on this for a long time and had his own idiosyncrasies. And I think what that helps with is that I tell the students all the time, if you don't understand this, what I'm, we're up here discussing it right now, it took for a, maybe a decade to come to this. These aren't easy concepts, right? That shouldn't be taken for granted. This was a discovery. And he was actually, he was himself, was apparently really obsessed with heat. He was very cold natured. It was always really cold. And would, they, 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 there was reports that he would have all of his windows blocked with blankets and he'd wrap himself in blankets all the time. And he, and he thought that that was going to help him live longer because of something about heat escaping through your body that, that would uh, that cause you to, to age and die. And it turns out he tripped on one of his blankets going down the stairs, and that ultimately led to his death. Um, <laughs> so, and so you'll never forget that story. Right? <laughs> so so I, I think incorporating some of these things in teaching where these become hurt people, I think, is really important. And, and here's, here's another example of that. Um, so this is actually work um, uh, from uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, describing the aortic valve, the aortic valve, 
how the aortic valve functions. So it's kind of hard to see, but there's you know aortic valve leaflets over there, and thinking about how fluid must flow through this valve, and and the idea that you know problems with this valve can lead to altered fluid flow, and heart the, the heart has to work harder. And he was already studying this, you know, um, you know several centuries ago, right? And then connect that all the way through kind of how currently we replace valves, right? So these are common valve replacements. Now we have mechanical replacements, we have bioprosthetic replacements. We do this in my biomechanics class. And we talk about what are the problems to be part of this, right? And we have to think through things like, why do I need to learn about blood flow? Why do I need to learn about computational fluid? Dynamics? Why do I need to learn about, you know, tensile properties of materials? And, and how all those things would influence the function of these leaflets. And then what are the ongoing problems? There's no living tissues, right? These things don't grow with kids if you have to do this in a pediatric population. And starting to think through what are, if we're to be learning in our class, what are the biomechanical solutions to, to some of this and, and helping them understand ongoing research and also connect it back to discussions on health and equity and what we can do in education outreach, finding people early so we can, Again, we don't have to, we can we can incorporate research and what's going on now into our teaching. So this is actually a project that was just due last week in that class. There's a lot here, I'll just kind of explain. But um, the students are gonna kill me because I haven't graded these yet and I should have graded them this week. Um, but where we take, I, you know, in my project, I try to take real data. This is actually from the lab. So this is from, from mice that we obtained these echocardiograms from. And I had them analyze things about these data using fundamental principles. and it, and what I'm trying to lead them to is if you look here, we, we had them, you know, if you're in this field, analyze this as if it was a purely laminar flow, like just steady, easy flow, versus if it's purely inertial flow, right? And what they learned, because I have, you know, a lot of students come into the classroom and they say, why don't I can go to ANSYS, I can put in some boundary conditions, I can hit enter, and I'll get an answer. Just my computer is going to spit me out an answer. Okay? So what you can show them here is that they can show, so by doing these analyses we learn in class, the, what the bounds of their solution should be for this, right? And then we can even start incorporating some computational programs to show that sometimes the computer's not always right, depending on what you're feeding into it, right? The, your answer can blow up, right? And it gives you a way to check what your computational solution should be, right? And, but you're then still, you're grounding foundational principles into these complex situations, right? And why they need to understand things from the, from the very beginning. And then you can extrapolate. Right? So that, that Fourier example, you can then talk about canons, and then you can zoom out and say, hey, turns out this frequency analysis stuff is good for a lot of things, right? And but but they're still granted why it was developed originally. So I'll move on to the last part. That's quite a bit here, and that's in the service part. But I don't think of service as, as again any different than these others. And, and really I'm talking more than just departmental, college, university service, I'm not talking necessarily about surveillance committees and things like that, which is all extremely important. I'm talking about things that, you know, bigger in terms of impact on, um, on your community, okay? And so back to, you know, to kind of where I come from again, being a first-generation college student and not understanding that research was, you know, a mission of the university. Yeah, I want to change that. and And in all honesty, I remember exactly where this idea came. So this idea came from me being on Facebook, which I don't recommend, um, <laughs> and seeing a someone I went to high school with post something about uh, these large containers of hydrofluoric acid, right? And like all this like safety stuff around hydrofluoric acid. It's like, I can't believe we let them put this stuff in our toothpaste, right? And, and not realizing that that's a very different thing, right? Fluoride versus hydrofluoric acid are, you know, very different. Um, and, you know, thinking through the Obviously, there's, you know, and, and we all know this, right? There's a distrust in communities right now, especially, you know, around science, around research, and, and trying to break that down and getting things outside the lab. And so um, Zach Danziger and I were talking about that particular thing at lunch one day, and, and where could we go? And we decided breweries was a great place to go. We like thinking out there too, right? And so um, so what we started doing was this search for science club where uh, once a month, we would go out to different breweries around Miami, and we would invite faculty. I put Dr. Lynn here because his were always... Uh, absolutely amazing, but he's an imaging expert. So let me look at this title. You know, you are so transparent, right? And it's something that people, you know, might be interested in and approachable. And then having folks then come out, you know, experts in their field. You might recognize this person. Uh, <laughs> come out and give lectures to these uh, at these breweries in a very approachable way, right? Whether you're in science or not, but try to break down some of those barriers. And we we don't allow powerpoints. Um, I think that's very important. You have to use uh, kind of this 
it's probably showing my age, but like a win, lose, or draw tablet where you're, you're, um, you're sketching things up on, on the board. So, you, so Dr. Jung was very good at sketching a chicken. And so she can then explain to us why a chicken can still run around with its head cut off, right? And, but then connect that back to motor control, right? So, you know, you can, you can, again, have these kind of very interesting, approachable situations to get people excited about it, interested, and then you can sneak in a little bit of science, right? And, and, and help them understand what that, um, what the ongoing research is. And I was always impressed by the kind of questions and discussions that would come out of this. Yeah. She can do good chicken dance too. <laughs> I think there was dancing involved in that one too, if I, if I remember right. Yeah. So, <laughs> so this, but this is fun, right? This is a way to get outside and, and also, but I think, and it's not just, you know, I don't want it to sound like, uh, we need to come down from the academy and teach the masses, right? I think it's also important for us, right? I think there's something to getting out and making sure that we know why we're doing what we're doing, that we see what the impact is. And, and I honestly think that the true measure of how well you know something is how simply you can explain, right? Can you, can you take very, very complex concepts and explain to someone who doesn't understand? Right, um, I think it's extremely important. So, kind of along with that as well, and, and thinking through again, you know, you know, again, all this is self-serving, right? I wanted to to get out to a brewery and talk to people, right? Um, and then, I, so uh, another thing that we we developed was the Miami Heart Day. Right, so um, I was a junior faculty uh, at the time, and I and I reached out to Dr. Jung. She was talking about this last night, and I said, Ronnie, right, why don't we? Uh, have a Miami Heart Day in February. She's, and she asked me, she said, Miami has a has a heart day? I was like, we're going to, right? <laughs> so, um, and we actually, so this was um, over, I guess, seven years ago now. We just celebrated our, our seventh heart day. And this is an event that we've grown. But really, this was just for me to try to understand who in the local Miami community was doing cardiovascular research and like see if we could build some kind of ecosystem. Uh, you might recognize the person on the left over there. That's Dr. Balachandran. Uh, so he was our keynote speaker this year at the at the heart day event, uh, which is just a, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it's turned this whole symposium where undergraduate students and graduate students and companies come out and present posters here. Um, and this year we had um, at one point over 150 people attend, including 80 high school students. And so again, thinking through how do we get outside the line? How do we bring people in to see what we're doing? It's not just go to them, invite others to come into our setting. And we did things like we worked with FIU Esports and developed um, this virtual reality system where they could then kind of go through the anatomy of a heart and pull a heart apart. And, um, and then this is Valentina down here talking about our work with the stethoscope and having them listen to different heart sounds. And can they identify differences and showing them what machine learning can do? You know, we had cabling by our students who were um, talking about healthy heart habits and, and giving things away. So really engaging people in this conversation that aren't directly in, in, in our community. And this is, this is, I wanted to point this out. So this is uh, Amy Reed, who I work closely with, who runs or helps with our Undergraduate Resource Society, which is a big thing in, uh, at FIU right now. And I want to spend my last bit talking about our work with undergrad research. So she was there also then recruiting people into the program. Again, you've got high school students who might consider coming to FIU. They want to, how can they get involved in this? We have formal mechanisms for them to get involved and learn about research and then maybe grow uh, within our institution. More, more on that in a, in a minute. But we also do this within our department. So in, in a lot of our students in this program are part of the Undergrad Research Society. Um, so we leverage, we have a, a culture um, foundation endowment uh, at FIU and BME. And we leverage that to create this culture undergraduate research excellence program. And so um, uh, and Aranu and, and um, uh, some of the folks there at FIU had developed this just before I came, but it hadn't started running. So I, I initially jumped on this as something that I wanted to be involved with just because, again, that's where I started was undergrad research, right? And I only did it because I needed a job and it changed my career trajectory, right? So this is an outstanding way for us to start paying students on an undergrad level, get them involved in a program. We bring students in as a volunteer and then we can transition to this program where they get more and more responsibility in the lab. They get, uh, they get paid for being in the lab. But what we also do kind of in secret with their learning too are things that we, we were told workshops, how to communicate science, right? We bring them out to our thirst for science events. We get them involved in heart day. Uh, they're learning practical skills that are useful throughout their lives. Uh, and also some of them then choose to go on research. So I can tell you our fellows, we've had six fellows at this point in this program. We, we treat them almost like graduate students there. Um, and they've gone to places like, two of them are at Georgia Tech. 
uh, one is at Hopkins, I believe, one went on to Spain to do um, a sort of uh, engineering management fellowship, one is going to be a PhD student at the University of Florida. So these are really top-notch students who are going out and doing something with that research foundation uh, that they that they built. So this is a program that we're that we're very excited about. And on the university level, we're then now coordinating very closely with the Mark Ustar program. So this is an NIH-funded program that does something very similar, where students come into this program, they get paid. This is really intense, um, where they have to write formal reports every week. But then again, students are leaving this program and going out to the best you know, graduate programs in the country. So getting involved in, in, in undergrad research really early at a high level, right? And what, again, the biggest effect here is that they're, they're staying at the university, they're making money, they're learning things in the lab that's supplementing what they're getting in the, in the classroom, they're learning how to communicate, they're developing all of these skills that are going to be valuable no matter where they go, right? And we're, we're, we're um, leveraging resources we have to create those opportunities. So I'll leave you with this. So this is something that we're, that we're building at FIU now. So turns out at that Heart Day event, the very first one, as I had pitched this idea to Ranu, and then I was like, well, I've got to pull this off now. There's got to be people here, not just my lab, because it was dominantly you know, focused on, on my lab that first year. But I wanted to get people in. I started just randomly Googling Miami Heart, Florida Heart. Who's doing anything with Heart in Florida? And I ran across this foundation, the Florida Heart Research Foundation, which um, has a very large endowment, but they, they had um, been a hospital in Miami Beach, sold their building, and now they exist to fund cardiovascular research. And they came out with that first event and have been supporting this since. Uh, so they, they already fund research, but then we then started talking to them about creating the Center at FIU for Innovation in Cardiovascular Health, which I like to think of maybe a miniature version of what you're trying to do here at IQDAR, perhaps. Um, but where they're going to give us $15 million in funding approximately over the next six years. This has actually already started, the funding part has. We're working on the naming and some of this other stuff. Um, but they, we're, we're increasing our infrastructure. We're creating this environment where we can do top-notch research from everything from basic through translational. So there's innovative, uh, there's funding for translational research projects, but also yeah. note these other things. They're now supporting that a summer high school research program. So those students who come to our heart day can then apply to be part of the summer high school research program. They come back in the summer and they're involved in research in our labs as high school students. Then they're funding opportunities for undergrad research. They've added two slots now to that Mark Ustar program uh, where they're paying students. So some of those students who last year who were part of the high school program are now undergrads at FIU who are continuing working in our labs doing undergrad research. And then they're funding full stipend and research funding, $35,000 a year stipend plus $25,000 a year research funding for PhD students. We have five of those now. So you can now think maybe it's not the same person, but it could be someone who's gone to that high school undergrad program and then joins the PhD student, fully funded for research that they can then complete. And then they're also now giving fa faculty startup funds for three new faculty. So, you know, probably wouldn't be healthy for the same person to go high school all the way through faculty, but, but you know, but you could imagine a world where that person who maybe is a PhD student or whatever, then joins the faculty and has $750,000 through this, this funding mechanism, uh, plus whatever FIU will give to, uh, to start the research labs and, and then gets involved in the translational research projects that they're funding later on for, for senior faculty, right? Uh, and then they're also funding the community outreach and education courses. They're helping still with, with our heart data events. They come out and they provide materials for that and then do a lot with the local hospitals to, to talk to patients about, about what's going on, on the research side as well. So this is something we're building to try to take, again, all of that, right, from the research to the service and the teaching and putting it all together as this, this one combined program. If you're interested in any of these things, contact me directly all the way from, I don't think we have any high schoolers here, but high school all the way through faculty, um, I would be happy to discuss any of these with you if you'd like to come visit us in Miami. Um, I've been super fortunate to have amazing collaborators, uh, many of which you know aren't listed here. Uh, this is part of my team. We have a really, really big lab now eight PhD students, a lab manager, a master's student, some, somewhere along 20 undergrads, because uh, I can't tell them that because of where I started. Uh, so it's a really fun place to work. Feel free to follow us on social media. I run the, the I guess, X account now. My students run the uh, Instagram account. It's a lot more fun than the X account. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but follow us there to keep up with, with what we're doing. But I'd be happy to engage in any discussion, take any questions. Sure. Thanks for the presentation.
<laughs> yeah, we, we, oh yeah, okay, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so the question was on um, science communication strategies and the things that work and don't work. Uh, and it's something that that um, that we focus on a lot in my own individual lab, but I focus on also in the peer program. Uh, and a lot of that goes all the way back to Mark Krausnitz, my first mentor, who was big on scientific communication and, and being able to clearly communicate things. Um, so uh, what we, well, there's a couple, there's a couple of issues, right? So um, one, a problem that we have is that, uh, you know, we, as, as you grow in research, sometimes it's easy to forget what you did, right? In fact, it's very easy to forget what you did, right? Which I think is part of that is in just practicing. It's, it's important to go out to people who don't know, right? Who don't know anything about what you do, and talk with them and get their honest feedback about it. Right, because then you it helps ground you remember what you don't know, and at the level you start to learn the level which you have to explain, right? Um, and I think that's what we're trying to do, say, in my lab now, for example. So we spend I divide my lab meetings per month. I have a writing meeting, um, I think we call data meetings where we talk more of a traditional lab meeting. We talk about data. I actually force my students to give like chalk talk sometimes, like where they're going with the research, uh, and then we have a presentation. So the writing and presentation we then sit together, and the lab's big enough now where we you know, one side doesn't know what the other is doing, at least not to the you know, really detailed level. And so we read each other's stuff. We In lab meetings, you have to write an abstract right now. And then I'm going to give that to someone who I know doesn't know anything about it, right? Or you give a presentation, and I'll pick on people in the lab say, ask, ask a question. Right? And what you find is that they were too scared to ask a question because they had, they had no idea what the person was talking about. Right? But, but then I use that. That's not, the, that's not the questioner's fault to me. That's the presenter's fault. Right? And, and so... I guess the, the moral of the story is that you have to get out there and practice and you have to get out there and, and try to talk people outside of your field, right? Um, you have to have people read things that aren't, uh, you, know, aren't uh, you know, aren't in your community, right? So that's the biggest thing, get that, that honest feedback. And that's where you start improving because you start to see how to, you know, tone down your language perhaps or how you might have to explain things. But there's also an understanding what your audience is, right? Because sometimes you want to talk to people in your Right. And, and I think that's what that's an important part of the training process. It's like, who is this intended for? The best piece of advice I ever got in communication was, uh, especially written communication, was by a guy named Peter Libby. He's a cardiologist at, at the Brigham. Uh, and he said one time to me, uh, You should not write to make your reader think that you're smart. You should write to make the reader think that they're smart. And I think that's that's the key. It's, it's talking to people in a way that they can understand what you're saying. They can be feel like they're part of the conversation and they feel smart because they get what you're doing. I don't know if that answered your question. There's no easy answer to the, the answer. <laughs> yes, sure. Right. We have a question from uh, one of our Zoom viewers. Um, what uh, what were some of the major hurdles that you had uh, come across in establishing this program? Um, if you could just maybe rephrase because I think the yeah. microphone is better. Yeah. So the major hurdles we came across in establishing these programs. Uh, so one, I was, I was lucky to have supportive mentors, right? And, and that, 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 uh, that's one, one thing that was not a hurdle, right? Um, you know, so in all honesty, the biggest hurdle is always bandwidth, right? Personal bandwidth, right? And, 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 and I do want to say that, you know, it's important to take care of yourself as well. Uh, and I am not the best example of that. Sometimes I have a way to, I have a, um, uh, a bad habit of spreading myself thin, but, but, it's in things that I love, right? And, and learning to say no. So that that's one that you have to say, is this something I can take on? And ask yourself truly, is it something I can do a good job with if I take it on? I'm not just doing it because I think it should be done. Um, and, and then if it is something you truly want to do but don't have the bandwidth, then it's finding people who can then help spread that work with it, right? So I think that's that's important. Um, and then the other part is, is, is resources, of course, right? I mean, we've, again, been lucky that by you work and leverage some things like our endowment or, or the resources we have at the university, but resources are always scarce, right? And, and it's just trying to see how can I put things together? There's never gonna be a perfect program. It's never gonna run exactly the way you want it to run. Um, but what do I have now that I can then build in the future? Don't be afraid to start small and then grow like our heart day events that have now grown uh, with a lot of sponsorship to these larger events. It started with 50 people or, or less, which are mostly just our undergrads, right? And that's okay too. 
comment that it's time to franchise first for science at IQR. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Well, uh, Dr. Danziger, uh, Zach has moved, recently moved to Emory, and so he and I have already talked about ways that we would love to see if there's a way to get this going like across different campuses, maybe simultaneously, or you know whether that be we're just all kind of doing it simultaneously, you know, independent event, or maybe there's a way to think about spreading the workload where, for example, he does one at Emory that we telecast in, right? Or I do one at Miami that he his group telecasts into it. And if we could figure something out like that. So if you had a lot of different people doing it, maybe you're only responsible for it once a year or twice a year or something. And but you can still get together and be bring in the community and have a TV set up where someone else is doing more of the heavy lift. Plenty of microbreweries to go around. <laughs> uh, thank you for the talk. It was so interesting. Um, you speak a lot about mentorship, and I was just wondering if you can talk about, from their perspective of the PI, what it means to be a great mentor to graduate students, undergraduate students, and advice for graduate students to also be great mentors to undergraduate students. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's. It, oh yeah, sorry. sorry. Um, the question was about mentorship and, and as, you know, from the perspective of PI, what it means to be a good mentor uh, and how grad students can also be maybe a good mentor to undergrad students. Um, and it's something we don't do a good enough job of preparing our grad students for. Those who want to go into academia, like you, you become a really good bench top scientist, and then suddenly, I mean, my students get scared when I go in the lab now, right? Because something something's wrong. But I don't. I don't even. I have no idea where our pipettes are. You know, I, I don't. I don't. You know, I write emails for a living now. Um, <laughs> but, um, but you know, most of my job is managing people, mentoring people, giving people tissues since they cry across my desk. You know, not hopefully I didn't make them cry, but you, just, but, you know, but being there and, and helping people find their way like in their career, right? Um, and and we don't prepare students a lot for that. Um, but it, I, I think the first thing is just being a person, right? It kind of goes back to what I was talking about teaching, like, you know, making for you to somebody who's a person, right? And that, that's, that's kind of an extreme example, but but also letting them know the things that, you know, that it's okay that, you know, we, we deal a lot with imposter syndrome, we deal a lot with, you know, with failure in research, at least things not working the way that they're going to work or alter timelines. And, and having a little bit of compassion there, right, I think is, is a, to me, one of the most important parts of, of mentorship. Um, but then also not being, being you know, not being afraid to uh, to give an honest opinion, to, right? the, the couching in a way that makes it clear that you're coming from a place of understanding and, and compassion, right? Um, that's part of it. The other part that's even harder is um, each individual that you mentor has different needs and comes from a different place. And you'd have to take sort of a unique style with each mentor. You have to understand what that person needs at that time. And that's a really hard thing to do. And that just, again, kind of takes practice and listening a lot. You know, a lot of mentorship is just listening and learning what that person needs. And you've made it kind of a funny example. So we realized this recently in, in one of my lab meetings that I have one student who I need to tell that student you're doing a great job. This is awesome, keep going. I have another student who I kind of need to tell, you know, I'll be able to do that. And that motivates that student. It, and I kind of do it in a joking way, but that motivates that student. I'm going to show him. I'm going to go out and do this kind of thing, right? Um, so kind of learning what each student needs is important. And I think, so we, how my lab's gotten so big is all of my grad students now have their own mini labs, basically, in in um, in our lab. So each of them have about two to three undergrads that they mentor. And we spend a lot of their time, a lot of time in their individual meetings talking through how to mentor their undergrads. And I think that's a conversation. Those are conversations we need to have more in academia with our grad students. Excuse me, I wanted to ask a little bit about your collaborations with physicians. How that impacts things like yeah. So the question was the uh, uh, getting better at this. Uh, the, the interactions with clinicians, the collaborations with clinicians, and how that impacts things that we're we're thinking about in terms of societal engagement and translation. Um, cr critically important, right? Um, and and um, the, the the difficulty there, and maybe this is the same up here. I don't know. Is when you know when I first moved to Miami. You know, our department doesn't have, we have a medical school now, uh, but they're mostly focused on medical student training, right? And we didn't have an established hospital. We didn't have 
a group of the co college medicine clinicians who really were engaged in research, right? So I kind of had to go out and find people who were willing to talk with me about things. And that wasn't, they're, they're not always the easy people to get a hold of, right? But it's trying to create those relationships. Um, but then once you have them, you know, you lean on them. I learned things from talking to my clinical partners all the time, right? About things that they're seeing with their patients that, you know, we, we assume that atherosclerosis is atherosclerosis. This is a disease where you get these lipids and stuff in your blood vessels and it leads to a heart attack. And we were, he was talking about the different types of atherosclerosis and different types of vessel remodeling, whether you have chronic kidney disease or diabetes and how where, you know, it impacts, you know, the vasculature in the foot versus in the, you know, the femoral arteries versus in the coronary arteries and things that I had no idea. He doesn't even know why, right? And those kinds of conversations then got me thinking a lot more about research. Like, what can we do to help figure out why? But then also, what can we do to help find people early, you know, to diagnose people, what would be involved in the clinic? I think that needs to be, they, when we talk about stakeholders from a biomedical perspective, I think the clinical part is something that's a critical piece of that. I mean, the research, the clinical, and the patients, I think all need to be kind of equally involved. And they have access and touch to the patients as well, right? So they can help kind of facilitate those interactions too. Do they show up at your extra science things and other events? And we've, we've had them at the heart data. Um, and so they definitely show up there. I haven't had one at Thirst for Science yet. I'm going to have to work harder. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, but I, I, you know, bringing them, yeah, bringing them in and let them know what kind of capabilities you have. So that's something we've tried to, so FIU has this new affiliation with Baptist Health, and we try to bring in people from Baptist to say, hey, this is what we can do as well, and let them understand kind of what we're doing from our perspective. So they can then, you know, ask questions, and they, they come up with ideas too, like things that we hadn't thought about. Oh, I didn't know you could actually do that, right? I didn't know you had a 3D printer here, whatever it is, right? Um, and, and, and so breaking down those barriers. Uh, do you, kind of, uh, following up with things that you talked about with Valentina doing this I core part or not, do you have any learnings or experiences of how students should or should not get into this kind of effort while they are graduate students? Yeah, um, that's, that's a good question. And it's a conversation I've had with Valentina a lot, but she's kind of going back and forth in terms of like what she wants her career to be. But, you know, for her, the important thing is she wants to see her research have an impact wherever she goes, right? And, and she's really interested in that translational research, which is why she's pursued this. Uh, and she has that kind of personality that she's going to get out there and, and she's had no, no fear to stand up and give a presentation, give a pitch talk to an investor or things like that. So I think you've got to know a little bit about yourself and what it is that motivates you and where you're interested in. Not every student necessarily needs to be involved in it, right? If that's not something that, that you're passionate about. Because it is extra work, right? Meaning it's extra work outside of your just being at the bench, right? But for Valentina, it's become part of her dissertation, right? So the lead for Startup FIU, which you know develops, you know, helps us spin things out of the university, is on her dissertation. So part of her dissertation will include, you know, that portion of her work. So we've integrated, um, but but it certainly you know takes time away from being at the bench. Right? So it just kind of depends on, on I think what you want to do there. And if that's something you're passionate about, certainly would encourage it. Uh, so uh, I'll just add to that. I think uh, we actually wanted her to stay in that lab. He, you know, we are just part, made a hard pitch, but you know, he didn't want to accept it. And uh, uh, I did chief senior design project, and you know, I was a mentor for her. And then at that, at that time, we did the uh, local and uh, I quote project. She was having a mentor for her. I think that's when she was really, really interested. I said, okay, I want to do some kind of thing. Stuff. I want to make this change. Yeah, I think that's kind of cool. yeah, so yeah, and I think students like Valentina, you know, the, the message there was that you know she's always going to be interested in kind of the translational approach. And I have other students in my lab. Um, one of my other grad students started at the same time as her. He is very much more just kind of a just super naturally curious. He always wants to ask why, um, and, and maybe less motivated by thinking through translation. Just wants to know why things work, and that's a very that, and that's great too, right? So he's on the the valve project studying how melanocytes make elastic, right? So that we don't know, there's no clear pitch for that idea yet. But it's also extremely important thinking forward how we might treat valve disease, you know, how you know, congenital um, 
by custom valve malformations form all these different things that I think um, you know are also critically important. But he has no interest in getting out there and, and spaces. So again, it just depends on the individual. <laughs> How much bow ties is a part of my success? Um, it, it's critical. It's the most important part. <laughs> um, I actually started doing this as a grad student. Um, so we uh, uh, we had this idea. I think it was one of my friends, uh, Joe Shen, who started it. Who I decided that we were going to do fancy Fridays because you know we always usually just dress in t-shirts, sheens, or whatever. And I've kept with it ever since. And at some point, it became bow. It went from just being regular ties to bow ties. I don't. I just call those quirky. And uh, and then had an, now that's all I I wear. Only self like only self tie. You cannot don't buy a clip on. No. <laughs> uh, but yeah, then my sister incorporated it into uh, into my lab logo up there. So the, the hearts wearing a bow tie. And if you look at it, one part of the bow tie says biomedical, the other part says engineering. And our little CMRL card of from Modern Labs in the middle. We'd like to see ourselves the interface of biomedicine and engineering. So there's actually some thought that went into that as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> would like to go. There is a seminar at noon uh, that is going to be much more the technical part of it. So, if you're interested in the cardiovascular understandings of valves and how they form and the, all the underpinnings of it, which is really as you are a top notch researcher, whether you say it or not. So, so, that would be an opportunity. So, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.